The sky was a brilliant blue, as deep and clear as a dream of heaven, hung over the alpine meadows like the vault of a vast cathedral. In the lake below, a reflection could be seen in the sparkling water, a bright patch of purple with a long tail that fluttered even though no wind was ruffling the lake's surface. Andrew ran across the meadow trailing a line from a ball of string unraveling in his hands. Above him, the kite dipped and turned like a child at play, climbing ever higher, miraculously higher, into the brilliant sky where still no breeze had stirred. The string tugged between his fingers, and he played out the line, letting the kite freely soar. Now you got it, angel boy, came a warm, throaty voice behind him, and he turned to see Tess, her salt and pepper, hair catching the sun's rays, and her broad smile beaming with a light all its own. But, said Andrew, out of breath from his fast dash across a meadow, there's no wind, Tess, who said anything about wind? Tess laughed, squinting up at the kite as it glided through graceful figure eights across the cloudless expanse. It's a god thing, Andrew shrugged and turned to follow Tess's gaze heavenward. A god thing of course it was? A short distance away, on the crest of a knoll overlooking the lake in the snow-capped mountains, Monica sat on a mossy rock that seemed to have been placed there for just that purpose. Carefully, and yet with an assurance that comes in her lap she cradled a sketch pad, and from an artist's paint box at her side she dipped her brush into a bottle of jet black ink. From experience she layered the strokes of an ancient Chinese symbol across the thick, white paper. From broad to narrow, vertical to horizontal, the character began to take shape. The timeless balance of a timeless land. As she worked, a white dove appeared, making its way across the sky, and Monica lifted her free hand without even looking up so the bird could land on her finger. It's my favorite word, Monica said as the cooing dove seemed to peer down at the paper. Windowsill. Not much to look at in English, I'll admit, but in Chinese, why it's practically a work of art. She said the word again, the lilt of her brogue caressing the sound. Windowsill. Windowsill. Tess and Andrew stood beside her now, admiring her handiwork. Andrew held the kite, now a fragile, earthbound thing, as the bemused Tess shook her head. Now when do you ever imagine you'll need to write down the word windowsill when we're in China? Monica put the finishing touch on her calligraphy and set down the brush, waiting as the warm sun dried the ink. It was so beautiful here, so peaceful. If she had the choice she might linger in this meadow forever. But, of course, that wasn't up to her, and already she knew that they must be going soon. Did you know, she said, turning to her fellow angels beside her, that the Great Wall of China is the only man-made structure you can see from the moon with the naked eye? You mean you can't see all those squiggly lines? Asked Tess, what squiggly lines? Was Monica's reply? I think, Andrew added, she means borders. International boundaries? Exactly, said Tess with a snort. All those lines folks draw to keep themselves in. And to keep others out. That wasn't God's idea. No sir. See, the father made some things that were never supposed to stay put. Like ideas? Important ideas? She pointed to the kite in Andrew's hands. You take that little bit of cloth, and sticks, and string, for instance. An idea might not be much more than that. But you put a wind underneath it. And all of a sudden comma, that little notion is gonna take right off, and fly, and it's gonna go where it needs to go, without bothering about somebody else's border, because that's what it was made to do. She turned to both of them with the loving yet challenging look a mother might share with her child as he takes his first step, or a captain with his crew on the verge of a new voyage. That's what we're about to do. Be the wind under somebody's wings. Of course, she added with a sigh, whether they fly or not. Well, that's up to them. All we can do is give them the chance. The Manhattan morning was a busy blur of workaday rituals a quick cup of scalding coffee, a mad rush for the Uptown Express, and a crush of commuters all hurrying to their offices and cubicles honeycombing the midtown skyscrapers, their deep shadows cast wide by the rising sun. Perched serenely on the second floor cornice of a gleaming office building, Tess, Monica, and Andrew surveyed the surging masses, watching intently for someone special, a face in the crowd set apart for a purpose. Monica looked up, past the skyline and the heavy hanging traffic fumes to where a dove flew, straight and true, high above the hustle below. Across the street from the plaza of the high-rise, a bus lumbered to its stop, its passengers scattering in every direction, all that is, except one. Her name was Jean Chang, and as the angels on the ledge above caught sight of her, a quickening passed between them. Here she was, this was the one they had come for. And it was here, on a routine morning at an anonymous street corner in an uncaring city, that the story would begin to unfold. Jean stood silently for a moment as pedestrians pushed around her. Her lustrous black hair, held loosely at her neck, caught the sun's muted rays, and her dark eyes, almond-shaped and earnest, watched as a security guard walked to the flagpole in the plaza and began hoisting the ropes, raised the stars and stripes. 
As Monica watched, she saw a flush of color pass over Jean's pale and perfect complexion. Something, the angel could see, was stirring in this beautiful young Asian woman. An immigrant's pride, a reminder of hard-won freedoms, the blessings of liberty renewed again at the side of the waving flag. This isn't about flags, or countries, or politics, comma, Tess explained. As if looking through a window into Monica's own thoughts, this is about human hearts. Monica turned and smiled. She knew better than to be surprised, or to question her supervisor's gifts and abilities. Their work had always been about trusting, and believing that the Almighty would provide the guidance they needed as their situations required. Like that silly, purple kite that Andrew had flown, now held carefully in Tessa's hands. Monica knew it would do no good to ask why or what it was for. In time, plans and purposes would be revealed, even for a child's toy being carefully cradled by a wise angel. On the street below, a series of events began to unfold with all the precision of a well-rehearsed play. Jean suddenly stirred from her reverie, began to hurry across the street, worried now about being late for work. As she crossed the plaza, a sleek, black limousine pulled to the curb. The driver jumped out and hurried around to the side, but before he could reach the door, his passenger had pushed it open and stepped out into the street, his ear glued to a cellular phone. I'm not interested in what they're doing over at Good Fun Toys, Edward Tanner snapped back at the voice on the line, then listened impatiently as he began to move across the plaza. He was tall, with dark hair, and a confident air set into his finely chiseled features, still perched 40 stories high. Tess chuckled, this is gonna be good. Monica watched carefully as Edward began to move toward the lobby doors, looking past his expensive, tailor-made suit, with its French collar and glittering gold cuff links. She ignored his quick, no-nonsense tone of voice as he drove home his point over the phone. Look, he continued, we're only gonna consider this if it makes sense internationally. He listened before interrupting again. I know, I know. Alex is pushing China, but I'm leaning toward Mexico. No, I'm not making a move until I get all the facts. Beyond the clipped edge of his words, past all the trappings of conspicuous success, Monica thought she saw something. It was a flicker, a glow faint but unmistakable at the core of this handsome and supremely self-assured young entrepreneur. He's a good man, she said softly, trying to convince herself as much as Tess and Andrew. There's a warm heart beating inside him, but it's hidden. Like a diamond in a pile of ashes, she turned to look at Tess again. It's going to take some work to find it. There's a lot of work to be done here, replied Tess with an enigmatic smile as she pointed back down to the street. Watch. As Edward made a beeline for the lobby, Jean also crossed the plaza, heading toward the tall glass doors. For a moment it seemed as if the two might collide, but at the last moment, Something happened that stopped Jean in her tracks. The soft breeze blowing through the concrete canyon stiffened, and the flag, loosely tied to its pole, began to flap and crack in the wind. As Jean and the angels watched, the rope went suddenly slack, and the flag fluttered slowly to the ground, like a brightly colored handkerchief dropped by a passing giant alarmed. And without thinking, Jean hurried to the pole as the flag draped itself over the plaza's granite flagstones. She knelt to gather it up, directly in Edward's path and it was only at the last moment that he looked up, narrowly avoiding stepping on her and the flag. Monica caught her breath as Jean stood up with the flag in her arms, and for a quick moment looked into Edward's eyes. The noisy street seemed to grow quiet and, just then, she imagined that she could hear only the sound of two beating hearts. Edward slowly lowered the portable phone as Jean dropped her eyes and stepped to the side. Sorry, she and Edward said in unison, and they smiled, as people do when their eyes meet for the first time then. As quickly as it happened, it was over. Edward nodded once and moved past Jean through the lobby doors. Jean began to raise the flag again, unaware that, behind her, Edward had turned to take one more look, lingering and slightly puzzled. She was a beautiful woman, no doubt about that. But what was the feeling that had passed between them? Had they met before? It was then that his phone rang again, the elevator door slid open, and life resumed, swallowing up the questions along with the answers. Outside, Jean cinched the rope knot that held the flag in place. She looked up again, satisfied with her handiwork, and turned, and headed toward the tall glass doors. Monica, Tess, and Andrew watched until she was out of sight and then sat for a moment in silence even as the street continued to empty of people and the new day began in earnest. Tess sighed. The courage of a single person can change history, she said at and last as Monica and Andrew exchanged the look. She was giving them another clue, another hint of what was to come and what was at stake, but only if they answer the call when it comes. Will they answer the call? Asked Monica, gesturing to the doors behind which Jean and Edward had vanished. He may was Tess's reply, but he'll have only one chance. And what about her? 
Monica's voice was barely above a whisper. For her, said Tess, the chance will come a second time, and when it comes, she will know it. She looked to each of them, and in her eyes was an expression at once hopeful and sad, and that's why she may say no. Across the plaza, a man pushed a hot dog cart, and a homeless woman searched the garbage can for food. The angels perched in the morning sun were lost in their own thoughts. Monica looked up again into the sky, hoping for another glimpse of the dove. But above the towering building, all was an empty blue. And so it begins, she heard Andrew say. Tall windows framed the Manhattan skyline that was spread out like a panorama of prosperity. Edward Tanner moved purposefully across the lobby beneath a large sign, softly lit behind the reception desk, and reading Tanner toys. Good morning, Mr. Tanner, chirped the trim, and cheerful secretary behind the desk. Morning Janet, Edward responded with a preoccupation his employees had long since grown accustomed to. Alex here, already in your office, answered Janet as she held out a sheaf of papers, and these need your signature right away. It was too late. Edward had already disappeared down the hallway, and through the double doors that sported his name embossed on a shiny, brass plaque. Waiting for him inside was Alex Stella, the firm's high-strung attorney, who at that moment was staring at a small purple object with a puzzled expression. What Alex lacked in Heidi made up for a nervous energy. He was looking at Tess's kite, and the angel herself stood by, expectantly waiting to hear the lawyer's verdict. I don't know, Alex was saying in a puzzled tone. You don't turn it on. It doesn't light up or shoot anybody. Kids are very sophisticated these days. He handed back the paper stick and string construction. I don't think it's our kind of toy. Oh, but that's where you're wrong, said the irrepressible Tess. See, this toy isn't necessarily just for kids. It's portable. Why? It could fit right in your briefcase. Alex sighed. It was too early in the day to deal with crackpot toy inventors. And why would I want a kite in my briefcase? He asked. Well, answered Tess, pretending not to notice his irritated tone. You might want to fly it. You are a toy maker after all. No, said Alex with exaggerated patience. I'm a lawyer. Well then honey, Tess replied laughing, you need to be flying a kite. And with this one comma, it doesn't matter where you are. It's guaranteed to soar as high as you want? Wind, or no wind. The remark perked Alex's interest? You mean you've developed some sort of new technology, or something? See for yourself, said Tess, the twinkle in her eye unnoticed by the attorney. Go ahead and check it out. Then give me a call. We'll talk. From across the room, Edward cleared his throat announcing his presence. Alex straightened immediately and, putting his hand on Tess's elbow, nudged her toward the door. Fine, he said, we'll be in touch. Tess let herself be moved along until they passed by Edward, where she suddenly stopped and looked the young executive straight in the eye. You like kites, Mr. Tanner? She asked. Sure, Edward answered. There was something about the intensity of this eccentric woman's gaze that stirred a strange feeling deep inside him. Why not? A kite's like a soul, Tess continued without breaking her gaze. And you know, everybody likes to fly. This lady was just leaving, said Alex, as he pushed Tess to the door a little too forcefully, closing it behind her and leaning against it with a relieved sigh. Toy inventors, he said shaking his head. They're a whole different breed. Edward was perusing the kite with casual interest. A portable kite, he mused. How does it work? Never mind that, said Alex. I got a call from Isaacson this morning. The investors are getting nervous? We've got to come up with a way to reduce costs. We just can't stall anymore. We've got to close the plants down south and get an operation started in China. I thought we were considering Mexico? Alex shook his head again in a gesture that mixed exasperation with affection. How long have we known each other, Eddie? He asked. I seem to remember a dorm room at Syracuse, said Edward with a smile. Exactly, said Alex. And in all that time, have I ever steered you wrong? He leaned across Edward's desk, picking up objects randomly a paperweight a fountain pen stand, a stapler and turning them over. Look at the made in China, made in China, made in China. Look to the east, old friend. That's where the future is? Alex was getting excited now, waving his hands and moving in close to make his case. I've got a file in my office this thick. He continued, holding his thumb and forefinger an inch apart. Letters of introduction, inquiries, business proposals, all from Chinese companies. The labor's cheap. The raw material is bottom dollar. I'm telling you, Eddie, we've got people over there just begging to save us money. Edward folded his arms and leaned back against his desk. The morning sun shone brightly through the penthouse window. And he thought to himself how much he valued his old college roomie. They'd been through so much together, building this company from scratch. And now it was all about to pay off as demand for Tanner Toys made them the hottest newcomer in this fiercely competitive industry. Of course, if Alex said China was the place to be, he was probably right. His friend made a habit of doing his homework, 
But Edward only shook his head and looked doubtful. But we don't know anything about China, he said, wanting to see the grand finale of Alex's performance. I'm way ahead of you, his friend replied with a grin. I've already gotten a consultant, expert on the whole Pacific Rim thing. She'll walk us through the import-export game. Wait a minute, interrupted Edward. She. Alex arched his eyebrows, his grin growing wider. Thought that might pique your interest, he said. Smart as a whip, and she's pretty too. Edward smiled ruefully. His friend knew him too well, so, he said, when do I meet this smart, pretty Pacific Rim expert? An intercom sounded on his desk and the voice of Janet announced. Your nine o'clock is here. That'll be her now, said Alex, glancing at his wristwatch. Right on time. The door opened and Monica stepped into the room, dressed in a navy blue business suit, carrying a leather attache case, and looking, for all the world, like a successful young executive. A quick round of introductions and handshakes followed, during which the angel couldn't help but notice Edward's admiring gaze cast her way. The three sat down at the conference table, and Alex turned to Monica. So, he said, my boss wants to know why we should build our new toy factory in China. Is that a question you can answer? Indeed it is, replied Monica confidently and, snapping open her briefcase she pulled out a handful of papers, and passed them around. I've taken the liberty of preparing this prospectus based on your company's annual reports over the past five years, and a comparative profit and loss statement based on current economic conditions on mainland China? Of course, these figures must be adjusted for. She faltered, then stopped as it became apparent that Edward Tanner was no longer paying attention to her words. He had instead picked up Tessa's portable purple kite and was turning it over in his hands, like a small boy with a new toy. He's brilliant, said Alex, leaning over to whisper in her ear. Quirky, but brilliant? Do you mind if we talk outside? Edward asked suddenly Anne, Without waiting for an answer, he rose and walked to the glass door that opened onto the penthouse patio. At once mystified and amused, Monica and Alex followed him into the bright sunshine high above the surging city. A few minutes later, Edward was tugging at the kite string, while the tiny patch of bright purple was ducking and weaving, soaring over their heads and swooping between the looming shadows of the skyscrapers. It was a performance all the more amazing given the fact that, even at the dizzying height of the top floor, no wind was blowing. It's fascinating, Edward said, as much to himself as to the others. A physical impossibility, but a beautiful sight. Nonetheless, Monica interjected, her head craned to follow the kite's random flight. Um, about our Chinese project? Alex interrupted. Go for it was Edward's quick reply comma, his eyes still fixed on the tiny dancing kite. Go for it, echoed Monica, surprised by the snap decision. Edward turned to her. Alex thinks China is a good move, that's what I pay him for. Now what am I going to pay you for? Monica turned to Alex, who beamed a broad grin, and gave her the thumbs up sign. Well, said Monica, Mr. Stella has suggested that I accompany you to Beijing to evaluate the offers and help negotiate the trade agreements. Do you speak Chinese? Asked Edward, beginning to reel in the kite. A little, revealed Monica, but I'd feel better if we had a competent translator. Anybody in mind? As if by some magnetic force, the kite was pulled closer to Edward's outstretched hands. Monica shrugged. If I had a choice, I'd say someone in your company. Someone who understands the toy business. There's that girl down in contracts, Alex said, and snapped his fingers as he tried to remember. Jean something. She looks Chinese. Why don't you find out? Edward said as the kite settled into his hand like a trained bird. He folded it up and passed it to his friend. And while you're at it, try to figure out how this thing works. Alex looked across his desk to where Jean Chang sat stiffly in a straight back chair. The young lawyer, whose slight build and shock of sandy hair underscored his impulsive and boyish character, studied the beautiful, yet somber woman he had summoned to his office. Behind the attorney and slightly to one side, Monica stood, her arms folded, her face half hidden in the shadows of afternoon light. As she looked at Jean, she tried to penetrate the veil of sorrow that clung to her like a morning mist. What is it about her that makes me feel so sad? Monica thought to herself, what does she remember? And what is she trying to forget? But it wasn't sadness flashing from Jean's dark eyes in that moment. It was anger and, res and resentment, springing up like a hard shell around her. You ask me if I speak Chinese, she was saying with a cutting edge in her voice, because I look Chinese.